My name is uh, CJ Morell, and I'm the, one of the co-founders of this company uh, in technology. And first I'd like to say for everyone in the military or ex-military, I thank you for your service. Um, this means a lot to me today because uh, our youngest son is a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, about to be re-stationed in Fort Hood, Texas in October. And uh, he's lived with this, with me, for the last five years as we've been developing it. And our focus has been on a commercial, commercial applications uh, on the consumer side and the, the fleet side. And it's only in uh, the past year or so, with his active duty at Fort Benning, where he's really gotten interested in pushing us to really consider military applications for the technology. And so what I'm going to show you today is the first time anybody has seen our attempt at trying to help you understand how you can leverage our technology in a military environment. And by no means is this a comprehensive uh, presentation in that respect. You know more about it than I do. I'm not in the military. But I wanted to use these slides to help get you thinking about ways that you see that you could have it implemented and help you uh, in your day-to-day your -day business inside, uh, inside the military. Uh, we use this uh, quote from NHTSA. We showed this technology to NHTSA about three years ago and they said it's the only technology they've ever seen that they believe will actually solve distracted driving. And that's what we set out to do five years ago was to solve distracted driving. And what we ended up with was a platform that identifies and precisely locates smart devices inside a vehicle within five centimeters of accuracy. So let me go through. And so you say, okay, so what does that buy me? Uh, it buys a lot of things. Number one, if I know exactly where all smart devices are inside a vehicle, number one, I can protect the driver, I can lock the display of the mobile device when it's in the driver's zone to keep the driver from texting while doing what they're supposed to be doing inside that vehicle. And we thought we were uh, solving the world's problem when the uh, this large North, this large Japanese automotive manufacturer said, "You guys are missing the bigger point. You're identifying all of the smart devices inside the vehicle." That means you're identifying where all the passengers are inside the vehicle. And because of the accuracy of your technology, you can tell whether somebody has a smartwatch and a phone. If, if you're carrying multiple devices, tablets, iPads, because of the accuracy, you pretty much can tell how many bodies are in the vehicle and where those bodies are sitting. And that opens up a whole new world for us. We can ring fence the driver and keep the driver safe from being able to text while they're driving. But on the passenger side, it opens up a specific branded communication path to each passenger in that vehicle. And we, and we can do things based on where they're sitting. We can prioritize what we, what we want that communication path to actually do. We also have uh, patented a way to detect unauthorized devices brought inside a vehicle. So uh, when you're working with the fleet market over the last couple of years, a lot of the fleets told us the biggest problem we have beyond our drivers texting while driving is uh, bringing in their own personal <coughs> smart device into the vehicle or someone else coming into the cab with their personal device, which is not allowed in, in most fleets. And so if any device in the vehicle has our software on it, we can determine whether or not there is another device in the vehicle that does not have our software on it. I don't know where it is in the vehicle, but I know it's in the vehicle. And based on that, you can send a report or a message to somebody who's in charge to say, there's an unauthorized device brought into this cab. It's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. But that's green safety. This is one example of, the, of our thought process, taking our technology outside of the vehicle. Uh, we went to the uh, San Francisco Police Department 
about three years ago with this technology, thinking they would be interested in having first responders have this technology in fire trucks, ambulances, you know, you, you don't want your drivers texting while you know, going off to a fire. Um, they said it's great, but our bigger interest is we've got five intersections in the city of San Francisco where we have the greatest number of fatalities, pedestrians, walking into the, the crosswalk while they're texting and getting hit by a vehicle. So I'll, I'll address that. How we, you know, we've done a prototype uh, for that use case. So we call, the, the technology is called Halo. Angels, Halo, it's, uh, we had a low marketing budget, so that's what we came up with. Um, but what it is, in a nutshell, is we can precisely locate every smart device inside a vehicle. Use cases for that, and, and some of these other icons talk about uh, other extensions of that technology beyond just inside the vehicle. Uh, we're, we're working with a, a partner right now on the commercial side who's using our technology to identify a driver with a smart device approaching the vehicle. Where is that person approaching the vehicle from? How far are they away from the vehicle? And, and it's all around, uh, today the commercial side, instead of having a, a fob key on your key ring to unlock and lock your car, everything is shifting to the smart device, having the smart device lock and unlock your car. And then once you get in the car, having your smart device authenticate to start the engine. And our technology lends itself to those areas. A, Bluetooth gives you distance, acoustic technology gives you accuracy. And, and what we're doing is we're broadcasting an acoustic signal out of the vehicle sound system. This is World War II technology that we've patented to leverage with smart devices inside vehicles. Uh, we filed 70, we've got 76 patents, half are pending, half are issued at this point, around this type of use, these types of use cases. And so we're broadcasting an acoustic signal inside a vehicle, regardless of whether or not the sound system in that vehicle is turned on. As long as the engine is on, this acoustic signal starts to broadcast inside the vehicle. It broadcasts at 21 kilohertz, we can do from 19 to 23, depending on speaker system. Correct. Existing speaker. Great question because a lot of cars you don't have access, and I'm talking on the commercial side. If I don't have access to a Harman Kardon or a Pioneer or a Panasonic who will integrate our software in their sound system for car manufacturer, then we have to get those acoustic signals inside the car. And so we designed a small piece of hardware with two little speakers on it that we could attach anywhere inside the vehicle, powered by a battery or solar, that will just broadcast the acoustic signals. Once our software, the second part of this is that there's two pieces of software. One software in the vehicle that's broadcasting the acoustic signals. So now we're talking about software. And the other piece is our software sitting on the smart device. So if you're issued a smart device, our software can be on it. It's not a, it's not a motion intelligence application. It's a piece of software that's integrated into someone else's application that you need to do your job. It is why you've been issued that smart device. So we're integrated or embedded in someone else's application or someone else's software platform for, for some other reasons that you're using that to do your day-to-day -day job. And our software sits and runs in the background and it listens for these acoustic signals. And when it hears the acoustic signals based on time of flight, we figured out how to calculate where that device is in the vehicle within plus or minus five centimeters of accuracy. So, in this setup of this short video, you're going to see two people sitting in the front of a, an expedition. Think about it as any, any vehicle, any military vehicle, any commercial vehicle, truck, doesn't matter. There'll be a person on the driver's side and a person on the passenger side, and they both have a smartphone. And what you want to see, and hopefully you'll be able to see it on this, on the displays of the phone, when the phones move into the driver's side, 
you will see the display change on the phone and it'll say, caution, you are in now in a no texting zone. So the driver can't do anything with that, with that device. If that device was connected to Bluetooth to the, to the infotainment system, that still works. If you still want to use hands-free voice control, that all still works. We just lock the screen, we turn it red, we put a caution statement on it, and you can't do this. But if you hand the phone to the passenger, after a bit of time, because we want to make sure the drivers aren't trying to do this <laughs> while they're right, so we've, we've, done, we've been at this for four years. We've done all the hands through the sunroof and out through hair, and, and so our algorithms are pretty smart that have caught, I would say, 90, 95% of the, how do I beat this uh, technology kind of thing. And you'll see them pass their phones back and forth, and you'll see the displays will lock and then unlock, lock and then unlock. And then right at the end of the video, they turn on music just to show you that the acoustics are happening at 21 kilohertz. Most of us in here, I would bet, can't hear at 21 kilohertz. Um, uh, we are canine friendly. We have a slide on that. We've just done a big study on, uh, on dogs inside the vehicle. It has no negative effect on pets inside your car, inside the vehicle. Uh, but let me run the uh, video. It, it may be a slightly different application. Does the detected phone need to be on? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're at, yeah if, there's, if the phone is not turned on, then there's a whole bunch of things. We're not, they're not texting while driving, and we're not being distracted, and, and so you know, we wouldn't know that the phone is in there. If the phone is brought in and turned on or on as it comes in, the then we can detect that there's a uh, phone either with our software on or without our software on. Yeah, if I could detect it without having the phone turned on, I I would be buying islands for everybody in this room. <laughs> So as you see, the phone, the caution will come on, and after a certain period of time, this phone they this will again gets released. And this was our engineer. He's the other founder of his wife. So you get a short delay on this side, and then the phone gets released. And these times are are programmable, you know, based on the person there, the company that is implementing the technology. You, you decide what you want the phone to do or not do, depending on where it's located inside the vehicle. For how demonstration about, purposes, we've just picked this. How about the model on the driver? Is that expandable? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll 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 phone. So now, now they've turned on the this music in the car to show that even though the sound yeah. system is still playing so music, the, the acoustics have no negative effect on the sound system. The sound system has no negative effect on the acoustics that are that are measuring where those devices are in the vehicle. Um, you can you can because the accuracy is plus or minus five centimeters. It's actually plus or minus one centimeter. But I don't say that because I told my guys we don't need plus or minus one centimeter of accuracy. We we'll stay with five for now. Um, you can program how big you want that or how small you want that area to be. Um, we choose when for the first use case, for the driver safety use case, when the device is in the driver's side, we lock the display and we put a caution word. And, but whoever's implementing the software, you can decide. But you may want your driver to have access to a maps or a navigation program. So that makes, so we talked to Uber, Uber supposed to want the Uber app and Google Maps to pop up, but we don't want the driver to be able to do anything else. So you can make that policy statement in, in the software that we provide uh, that runs on the phone. It runs on both Android and, and uh, iOS. We just show everything, should, for the most part, we show on Android because we debug everything under the Android operating system first. And then once we prove that it worked and we understood the accuracies, then we ship it to, to iOS. Uh, this is one example of our, uh, we call it Halo PED pedestrian. And we filed a patent on this. Um, these are beacons. Uh, they're off-the-shelf beacons. They're off-the-shelf Bluetooth beacons. So in this case, we're not using an acoustic technology. 
uh, we decided to use a Bluetooth beacon technology because it was quick to implement for the city of San Francisco. And uh, we modified our software on the device to listen for a specific Bluetooth beacon so that once you come within a certain number of meters of a dangerous zone, so there could be a train station, a subway platform, a crosswalk, a construction site, I mean, it's an area where there's ordnance, and it really demands your full attention as you're entering the area. Our software will listen for this specific beacon, and then based on the, the area, we could lock the device, say heads up, you're now in a no texting, dangerous zone. Um, and we, did a, we did a prototype for uh, yes, you can you can have as many beacons as you want. Kingdom of Archimedes is being considered the actual clock. See, we can see the beacons, right? We know each stress And uh, so we set up a, a crosswalk demo. And, and so this is the application where, you know, he can do whatever he wants, but as he's approaching the beacons, the screen turns red, locks the screen, says, you, all right, you're now in a, in a dangerous zone. As you're walking through that zone, you can't text. And read your email, and when you exit that zone, your phone automatically releases itself and go back to doing what you're doing. Is there an authentication back from the phone to the beacons? No. So all I have to do is broadcast that, and I can shut down everybody's phone that has this. If you're correct. Yeah. You, can, you can put the beacons on telephone poles. We, we looked at these commercial beacons, they were cheap and they were easily quickly. They got little batteries that last for about a year or so. I mean, but you could build your own beacon if you wanted to get the cost down. But it's it, it, we did it for the city of San Francisco to prove to them. But but we, we we filed a patent, we proved the concept, it works. But then we put it on a shelf because we're a startup. We've we've raised, we've put about a million dollars of our own money into the company. There's five of us, um, and we raised another million dollars in friends from friends and family over the last 12 months. And so that money is enough funding for us to pay our legal bills, which are the 70 plus patents that we have on all the technologies that we've developed, and for the, uh, the engineering talent that we've hired um, out, you know, outside the United States, getting the low cost. We have some engineers in Romania and some in Vietnam who do write the code for us. Uh, but we do the architecture here in the United States and we test it with QA. But our focus has been 100% around productizing the software inside the vehicle for the two largest, uh, the North American carrier and, and the, uh, the Japanese OEM. Uh, but but we, see, we see this technology having lots of legs for the use cases uh, inside the military. Um, when you think about it, we, if you can broadcast well, in a warehouse, you've got a forklift operators, you don't want them to be texting while they're on the forklift. These speakers, you could broadcast our acoustic signal out of these speakers. If you have our software on your devices in this room, I could lock all the displays of your devices so you pay attention to me and not your phone while you enter this room. I mean, as of one example of a use case. Uh, so the technologies are uh, in, as I, I said before, outside the vehicle when this partner that we're doing proof of concepts now, as you're approaching the vehicle, the car guys want to know where are you approaching the vehicle from? And the acoustic technology is very accurate. And so with a speaker mounted somewhere outside the vehicle, underneath the, the car engine hood, for example, with one speaker, I could broadcast the acoustic signal and send that signal to the smart device that's approaching the car. It's good enough. One speaker is good enough. Two speakers gives me very good accuracy. The other two speakers gives me really, really good accuracy. But the whole intent was doing this so that it was cheap, so that we leveraged the hardware that was already in the vehicle. 
and just have our software integrated. Tim. Showing how the if they don't have the software, then it, it will it, if if it's in an area, so let's let's contain it to what I know today inside a vehicle. If somebody steps in the car with a smart device without my software on it, I can't do anything about that. Unless of course somebody is in the car with my software on it. We filed a patent that we can detect that there is another device in the vehicle, but it, and, and I can detect it's there, but it's not registering through the acoustic uh, technology, so I send a message to mom and dad. So you know it's there, but where it is. Correct. I know it's there, but I don't know where, and I don't know why, and I don't know why it's there and it doesn't have my software on it. So think about the markets we, we focused on were parents with teenage drivers to start and fleets. In both of those cases, Mom and dad don't want somebody else coming in the car uh, without this software on it, and fleets certainly don't want their drivers bringing in their own personal devices or having someone else come in the cab while they're on while they're they're hauling stuff back and forth, just bringing their their own device in. Uh, and that, and it's and again that technology we did a proof of concept, we wrote a patent on it, we can detect it, but we put it on the shelf, We're waiting for the first fleet that wants to do this fund it, and then we'll go back to productizing that. We've got a lot of these use cases that we've filed patents, we've done a proof of concept, we show it works, and we can think of 25 different use cases for it, but we don't have the resource or the funding to go down those paths, and our board has kept us focused on do the inside the vehicle for consumer and, and commercial fleets, focus on that with the resources you have, and good job on that. Um, this military engagement is perfect for us, quite frankly, because there is a lot of technology behind this that people in this room could take and leverage and continue to develop and integrate into your own use cases. Some of them quite quick, quite quickly, quite frankly. And then, business case for the Yes. Yeah. Yes. Between the, the car and the auto, the, 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 there's one automotive manufacturer right now that we've completely consumed in. We've been doing 15,000 tests, like driving underneath transmission towers and rolling the windows down and testing to see how the acoustics work. Going at the end of uh, the LAX runways, rolling the windows down, and while jets are taking off and landing, how does it affect the inside of the acoustics? Yeah. Please. Yes, so. Yeah, so 5% so of most fleets, 5% of their accidents per year is due to distracted driving. And uh, depending on whether it's an injury, uh, an injury accident, a property accident, or a, a, both a property and injury or death, there's different costs to each one of those accidents. Most fleets are self-insured. So we know on average what fleets are spending on an annual basis in accidents due to distracted driving. And so for uh, $8 a month per vehicle, they get to sell, save themselves for a, a 500 fleet vehicle, it's, it's about $3 million a year. So for you know, 10 bucks a vehicle per month, they're saving themselves. The, the ROI is a no-brainer. Uh, on, the car, on the car guys, it's a whole... It's, uh, correct, one month return. Yeah, actually 45 days. Yeah, did math right there. <laughs> but on the on the consumer side, with the uh, the Fords, Volkswagens, and Toyotas of the world, it's a whole other business model. It's a license per car, which is probably I don't know what that number is yet. Um, I'd be thrilled to death with a dollar a car, get a bar island for the world. Um, but there's a, a monthly reoccurring revenue opportunity with the passengers in the vehicle and, and having services delivered to them. So the car guys told me, he said, CJ, we don't know as we move to autonomous driving, we don't know who's going to own the vehicle, but we do know there will be passengers inside the vehicle. So if I want to brand the inside of my environment, so passengers, when they want a car, to come and pick them up. I want them to call a Toyota and have a Toyota come and pick them up. And when 
when I get inside that Toyota, I want to recognize who they are by the smart device they're brought in with them, and I want to create a Toyota branded communication environment while they're in that vehicle. And I'm gonna, just like United says, download my United app, when you get up in the air, if you have the United app on your phone, I'm gonna give you access to all of these free movies and, and music, and I'm gonna give you the United environment while you're in my airplane. This technology allows them to do that now because they can identify in the car who the passengers are and where they're sitting. And, and it opens up a, a reoccurring revenue screen. Now the business model can change. We could take a percentage of the revenue, give them the software for free, and just take a percentage of whatever they generate on a monthly uh, revenue screen, right? The, the car guys are afraid that Google and Apple are going to take over the world with their cars and they want to get in on this. They want to get in on the application. How do I make money with my car on a reoccurring revenue basis because I'm not making any money on just selling cars anymore. Yeah, uh, ultimately, you're suggesting that, that these things be required, the chip be required in the phone in the United States or city, uh, or the cars themselves have to be included uh, do you, you remember that first slide that we took it to NHTSA? And NHTSA said, this solves distracted driving. Everybody just has the software on their phone, and we can implement the software inside the engines of all the cars, problem solved. Um, and it doesn't need a chip. I can, I can be like Megan's Law on all phones that are, all have to write all iPhones. If somebody gets kidnapped, everybody's phone now it automatically gets a beat. Um, that's the Megan's Law software that's embedded on everybody's phone. Apple and Google, they, they just embed it as part of the operating system. If we were embedded as part of the operating system, then that's nirvana for us. Relatedly, uh, how do the bad guys use this? Uh, for example, in the military, uh, the situation where you're, where you're in a warehouse or something, you've got people who are communicating on our side. You have to so the, the, beauty, the beauty of acoustics is that it's, it doesn't fly in the face of like RF and, and, and Wi-Fi. It's acoustic technology, you not know, the sound that goes out. It's another piece that I haven't addressed here. Uh, and on this page, and we're talking about being canine friendly, we've also added a way of putting data on top of the acoustic sound wave and being able to establish a two-way communication between the device and the thing that it's going to communicate with. So if you get, so the, the car guys, when they get in the vehicle, they can start it with the phone. They can use, and that's a, typically a low energy Bluetooth connection. They'll use the, they can use the acoustic technology as an additional layer of security to send the acoustic signal to the device with our data bits on it to establish another layer of authentication between the device and the, and the unit. So, yes. so our answer is no, I don't think that get the bad guys can break into an acoustic sonar sound wave and alter it and send it back. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. If they, had if they had our software, they would be able to tell, you know, who's singing and what device and what scene. Yeah, so we, we, we provide a 911 button on the screen, so that when the screen's locked, that's one of the that is. Or if the person is unfortunately in an accident by himself in the car, people do have a personal Correct. So OnStar told us when we, when we uh, did this with OnStar in the first 10 minutes, they said, so if we can tell with that accuracy, plus and minus five centimeters of every device that's in the car, I could cut the top of the car off and look down into it tell immediately if, 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 how many bodies are in the car, regardless of the number of devices, because of where those devices are located in each of the passenger and driver seats. So I can count bodies. OnStar said the biggest challenge we have is when people subscribe to the OnStar service, it's really about having an insurance policy in case I'm disabled and I'm hurt and I can't, I can't make the call or I can't talk to the OnStar speaker or microphone. OnStar knows where I am and they'll send a first responder to help me. 
OnStar says, all we know is who owns the vehicle, where the vehicle's at, and who has a driver. We don't know how many other bodies are in the car. This technology immediately says, when you turn that car engine on, it looks and sees where all the devices are in the car. Boom, I count bodies. I know there's four bodies in that car. So that goes from point A to point B or whatever you are. I know how where the body count is in that vehicle. Use cases come up like that just in a brainstorm session with anybody who starts to see what the technology is capable of. And again, it's not, it's World War II technology that we just figured out how to leverage in 21st century uh, smart device terms. This is our fourth generation of this solution, this platform. We started four years ago with microphones in a car and a little computer and they have the phones emanating the, the sound wave. You know, the microphones in the car picking up and triangulating our little computer would calculate where the devices were in the car. But it was extra hardware that the car guys had to install and they don't want to do that. They want to have class of their vehicle. And so then four times later we figured out how they would all software solutions. So we have about five minutes, so uh CJ, I came in a little late. I think I've got the gist of the acoustic sonar technology for locating the people in the car. You're also doing a hybrid with Bluetooth services. Would you do that for OBD2 or some other type of Bluetooth transceiver in the car? Yes, it is. That's, okay, that's the first question. The other one is, uh, could you utilize the microphone that's already in cars and that sync? Like, I've got a Ford Fusion hybrid and I've got a sync in the microphone. Could I leverage that microphone? Yes, so you would have to, yes, and that was our first set of patents, where we're using the microphones in the car to listening listening for the acoustic coming from the phone. Um, we, we switch, so the car then, the, the micro, what's ever on your end of that microphone has to do the calculation, right? And so that's where we, our little computer had to get installed inside the car and there was extra hardware and and we found within the next two years of coming up with the opposite way, doing having the car broadcast the signals and smart devices got smarter and smarter and smarter. So our patented algorithms ran much faster on the phone than on the computer. So really with the acoustic side, you the location and then you could possibly the initial signaling for the phone to go to your Correct. Mode, but you can't deliver any services over the acoustic, you have to do that. That's correct, yeah, absolutely. Correct. Yeah, I can put a couple of data bits on top of the acoustic signals to establish that I can tell the phone, I can say, oh, the phone says, oh, yeah, yes, okay, now there's a Bluetooth connection in here. I want you to pair with it, and you're going to pair in the cloud, and you don't have to do the nothing. And that was the car guy saying, one of the biggest challenges we have with consumers is pairing our, their devices with the, it's uh, paid it. This would do it automatically. That's awesome. Right? Could uh, your technology determine a phone that is on in airplane mode versus a phone that is on in fluid transportation? If it's in airplane mode, then it's not emitting a Bluetooth signal. So the answer is, well, what we are, the pattern that we follow is looking for the low energy Bluetooth signal that's coming from the phone, from the device. So if you're in airplane mode, I think it shuts the Bluetooth down. So we wouldn't. If it was an airplane mode, we wouldn't be able to detect it, sure. but it also wouldn't be able to broadcast either. So remember. So that ain't your flight attendant could detect who's not following the rules. <laughs> you could. You the airplane in the airplanes, the speakers they could broadcast the signal out. And now again, if everybody downloaded the United app, my software would be embedded in the United app. So during their safety uh, film. They could broadcast the acoustic signal through their speaker system, and everyone's phone would get locked for that three minutes that they have to pay attention to the to the safety thing. You could piss a lot of people off, but probably but you could do it. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. So, uh, great, great. There was a question. Um, uh, we have a slide here on alcohol detection, and I, I did talk about it, but we also invented a, a sensor that would get mounted above the driver. Uh, it's a consumable sensor that gets replaced every three to six months, depending on the environment that it's in, and it detects uh, ethanol alcohol. And we don't, we don't uh, tell you how drunk the driver might be, but we detect whether or not there's alcohol presence, and not just a bad change of lotion or perfume, but actual alcohol that there's alcohol in the vehicle, and then a message gets sent to somebody. And this was in line with the distracted driving parents of teenage drivers and fleets, um, you know, the alcohol detection. 
again, we, we did a bunch of good works. We did a bunch of patents on it. It, it will detect alcohol presence in a vehicle. And it's a go, no go thing. And then it's, you send a message and say, there's alcohol in the car. You can decide what you want to do. Mom, dad, you know, um, shut the car down, call, the, call your kids, whatever. It's, it's, it's very, very sensitive. So if somebody else was drunk in the car, but not the driver, he would probably pick, you know, you got to wish for that person's breath. Again, alcohol would be detected in the vehicle. And then somebody would have some explaining to this. It's 12 o'clock. There you go. There you go. So, so a lot of interest. So CJ is going to hang around afterwards. So by all means, please engage him. And uh, you know, there's lots more stories. And a couple hours on the yep. phone. Uh, so a lot of great stuff. So thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it.